Okay, but we're also here, or more importantly, we're here to talk about Gail's book, um, which I finished reading over the weekend and I really loved. Um, and I know we said, um, if you caught our, our discussion at the beginning, we are going to have um, Q&A at the, towards the end of the hour, but if you have questions even now, feel free to write them in the chat and I'm happy to start relaying them to Gail. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess the first question, kind of a, a easier one maybe, or, or hard, but what inspired you to write this particular story? Oh, that's a hard question. Oh no. Um, no, I'm just teasing. Uh, <laughs> Well, let me first begin by thanking Tina and thanking all of you for coming today. And I'm, it's my pleasure to be here to talk about the book. I actually never even asked Tina how she came upon me and the book. And I guess that's a, that'll be another day of yeah. Zoom talks. Um, uh, this particular book, being the eighth book, there was actually a long interval between my seventh book and my eighth book. Um, you know, I, I went through this period of, like, of thinking, do I have another book in me? You know, seven books, that seemed like a lot at the time. You know, maybe I need to take a break. And actually that's what I did. I took a bit of a break um, and did some nonprofit work and did some, and thought about what I wanted to write about if I was gonna write another book. Um, and I've been, I'm half Chinese and I'm half Japanese. My mother was born and raised in Hong Kong. And then she came over to, uh, the West Coast for college. And my father is Japanese, but he was from Hawaii. Um, so it, I had both the Japanese and Chinese cultures, but I was born here and it, I was born in San Francisco and grew up completely in the San Francisco Bay Area. In so many ways, I'm so much the American Bay Area kid. Um, you know, growing up in a wonderful area because we live in a melting pot where we know culturally so many different cultures, the foods, all of that. And when I began, when I first began writing, I did not know what I wanted to write about. I just knew that um, my background was in poetry. Um, I started out as a film major. I took a film course at college and I realized that it was so technical and so much more boring than I had thought it would be. I just thought the story somehow appeared on the big screen. Um, and so I, I decided to move over to the writing department. And I ended up doing all my undergraduate and graduate work um, in creative writing, which was within the English uh, department at that time. Um, and all my emphasis was on poetry. Um, so from there, you know, I just kept on writing. And after graduating, I started teaching and writing. And I started writing longer pieces and I started writing short stories. And I thought, okay, more words on the page, maybe it pays more. <laughs> and then from there, I, I just got to this point where I needed a larger canvas to tell a bigger story. Um, and, and so the idea of writing a novel kind of came into my head and I didn't know what to write about. And I thought culturally, this was a perfect time to actually research, get to know where I came from and who I am in terms of culturally and heritage. So my first book was Women in the Silk that takes place in China. And from that point on, I started penduling back and forth from my Chinese culture to my Japanese culture um, and writing books taking place in, in both areas. Um, and by the seventh book, I didn't really, I didn't know if I wanted to write about that area anymore. And I started thinking in the back of my mind of Hawaii, which is a place my brother and I had gone to a lot when we were young. You know, you go visit your relatives and all that. And so I started thinking, what, what about Hawaii would be interesting enough for me to be able to spend the time it takes to write a novel, which can be anywhere from two years to five years to 10 years, some people. Um, so I decided, you know, as thinking about it, I thought, what is attractive to me about Hawaii? Well, first of all, um, the weather, the environment, the beauty of it. And so I thought, well, if I write about the environment being one aspect of it, what else is that, 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 draws me to it. And what has always drawn me to the islands was how different it was, even from the Bay Area. 
which I feel is a melting pot in so many ways of different cultures. But when you get to Hawaii and you get off the plane, you know immediately you're in Hawaii and you know because of the feel of it, the sensory feels of it, the smells, the food, um, the faces you see, um, the, the large amount of Asian population that they have. And that fascinated me immediately. And I wondered how it became the melting pot that it became. How did it became, become this community in which they have certain foods they eat, um, a certain kind of pidgin language they, they communicate with. All of that kind of came up. Um, and I think one of the, the best things about being write, a writer is that you're given this gift of when you're curious about something, you can then spend years trying to study it, you know, trying to find out about it, reading about it, researching about it. Um, and the more I researched about the islands itself and the time when all these different immigrants started coming to the islands was the same time that I thought with all the beauty of the islands, there's also the other side of it, which is the disasters that they're always prone to have. Everything from the tsunamis, the storms, the typhoons, the hurricanes, the volcano eruptions. So you can see um, how writing is this process where you may start with this tiny little seed and the seed might be, oh, I'd love to write a story about Hawaii. Um, and then it grows into, well, how did, how did Hawaii become the islands they are now with all the different cultural immigrants that came together that had made this blended society. And then it's, oh, the environment of Hawaii is so amazing. You know, we go because of the beaches and we go because of the weather and the Mai Tais and whatever else draws us there. But there's also the other side, you know, when there's a good, there's always a bad. And what is that bad? Um, so, I mean, that's everything goes into how a book begins to shape itself. Um, and so with The Color of Air, it was all of those reasons. It was blended community. How do they become? Um, how are they affected by the disasters that come to the island? Um, and then I, of course, started reading about vo volcano and volcano eruptions. And, you know, I, I want to say, fortunately, there was a volcano eruption in 1935 that lasted six weeks and gave me the structure of the book. Um, you know, see, again, a thing that we look for as writers is how are we going to tell the story? How do you fit in the story and your characters and the idea of community with what's going historically and, you know, um, environmentally? And then all of a sudden I'm reading and I see, well, I, I knew before then that the, the big island of Hawaii is made up of five volcanoes, of which three are still active. Now, every time a volcano erupts, it adds more land mass. So that in itself is kind of a cool idea. It's like whenever it erupts, yeah, there's this disaster, but the island grows, you know, and more people come and more people settle there. So, I mean, it was all of that. And it was the six weeks that, that I found out about Mauna Loa um, erupting and part of it coming down towards the, the community of Hilo set up the whole storyline right there, you know, um, and allowed me to realize that the story will begin when it erupts and ends when it, when it stops. Um, and I just have to bring in the entire history of this community in the middle of that. <laughs> so that, I know it's a long way around, but you know, because a, a book, a book is complicated in that sense, you know, it just seems like it all lands on the page. Um, and the reader reads it, and, but it is painstaking in the sense that it's really just one little blossom and you take that and you bring it in a, a different way and something else blossoms. And then you begin to see the story and you're beginning to realize the characters, but it, it doesn't all come at one time. Thank Not you. One no, mention of pineapple, what? What, say it again? Not one mention of pineapple. Pineapple. Well, no, because I didn't, I, there is pineapple in there, but not in a big, large way, because I actually, in, in the beginning, in the 19, mid to late 1800s was when all the immigrants started coming to the islands because of the sugar and the plantation and the pineapple plantations. 
but mine focuses much more on the sugar plantations. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. Maris. <laughs> and when you were just talking about um, how, you know, Hawaii is actually this mixture of good good things and bad things because there's all these disasters I think that like plantation life is something that doesn't always come to the front of people's minds when they're thinking about sweet things like fruits and sugar but I thought the book really captured you know how brutal that system was for those people and um how it I mean yeah that is a, that is a really interesting idea because again that was another thought when I was writing the book how much of the plantation life comes into this story. Um, and again, that's always something you have to grapple with when you're, when you're writing a book. It's, does this take a back seat or does this take a front seat? And it's a really challenging part of writing historically and writing when you're doing a lot of research because it is so easy, you know, in, in, and I see a lot of first time writers do this when I'm teaching is that when they're writing a historical piece, they can't, they've researched so much, they can't, they don't wanna let go of any of the research, which makes it terribly hard because you, you love so much of what you're kind of digging up and finding out about, but it might ha not have a lot to do with the book, you know, in itself, but you're putting it in anyway. Um, and that's always a hard part, even for me now, after eight books, it's, there's so much rich, information, culture, and everything in the plantation life itself. On the other hand, that wasn't what I wanted to write about, you know, when I started. It was about community and how these people came together. But of course, you have, the, the reason they came together was the plantation. Um, so you have that also because it, it, it adds to how they live their lives, um, you know, what they were up against. Uh, a lot of reasons why they became such a tight knit community, you know, because the more the plantation owners tried to keep all these different races that came to work separated, the more they tried to get together. Um, you know, so it's all, all that is really fascinating. But again, it's always that worry of, is it too much? Is it too little? Why is a reader coming to this particular story? Did they want to read just about the plantation? You know, then this is not the right book. Um, uh, there are other books that would would cover it, you know, more in depthly, and and but those are the kind of challenges and things that you have to think about when you're writing. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> you could just cut me off when you say too much. <laughs> oh no 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 no! This is wonderful. It's so it's so interesting to hear. Your, more about the writing process. And that was one of my questions further down the list is advice for writers. So one of them would be don't, <laughs> don't, 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 over don't get bogged don't down. Over don't over don't over <laughs> don't over write. <laughs> well, I guess as a librarian, one of my questions for you is where, where did you do your research for this book or how did you do your research for it? Because um, you're based oh. in the Bay Area and it's story takes place in Hawaii. Yeah, well, you know, whenever you're writing a book, you're thinking in the back of your head, you want to choose a place that you want to travel to research at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was actually part of it. I go, oh, and a good excuse, a write off to go to Hawaii. Um, I actually did, I'm, I'm a big library fan, and I have actually, I, I'm going off in tangents because, because I'm a writer and because everything about my history as a writer has led to this particular book, just like everything I've done has led to every book I've written in one way or another. Um, but I have a library story that I always tell because the two, the, I'm, I've been always, I mean, I've been very lucky in my career, I think, you know, it's so hard to be a writer. It's so hard to get books published, um, especially now. Um, the time I began, I was very fortunate because Amy, Amy Tan had written The Joy Luck Club, mm -hmm. and suddenly every publisher in New York opened their doors to an Asian American woman author. Um, you know, so timing is so very important because there was a time when Asian writers were writing and nobody was publishing them. And it's kind of scary to think that it was maybe 25 years ago when you didn't read all the books of all the Indian and Asian writers that you're reading now. Um, 
I went to the library and I, when I decided that I was going to write Women of Silk, and I have to tell the story because it's my favorite library story, and how much I appreciate li libraries and librarians and indie booksellers. Um, but I was writing about a subculture of women in China who are able to live independent of husbands or family. And it fascinated me because I didn't know about them, you know. Um, and here I grew up in the Chinese culture because my mom was, uh, it, my mom was Chinese from Hong Kong, and because my dad was from Hawaii, culturally we were Chinese. Um, so, so I find a subject, and I know that I want to write about them, and I can't find any information. And this is was right at almost the the. the right at the point where computers were coming and internet was being available. But I was a stickler of having the books in my hand and researching um, and I couldn't find anything in the libraries or in bookstores about the subculture, the sisterhood of women in China. And I left a, I left a note with um, a woman who was getting her PhD at UC Berkeley in Chinese women's studies. And somebody told me if anybody would know about these women, she would. So I waited and I waited, she never got back to me. And I think about a month came, went by and I thought, well, I'm gonna give up on this. It's not the right subject, you know. And suddenly she called and she said, I'm so sorry I was away researching. Yes, I know all about these Chinese women. If you can find this book, it was published in the 1940s and it's a book of essays by women anthropologists and sociologists who had gone out to Asia, all different areas of Asia. And one essay is about these women Chinese silk workers that you want to know about. So I jumped in the car and I went to the Berkeley Library. Um, and I look in the computer and it says they have it. And I'm just like, you know, yes. This will be the, I, I, it's the right track after all. And I'm going on the shelves and I, I, where it tells me, you know, the, the, that's when you looked and you had the numbers and everything was like the old time. And I'm walking back and forth from the shelves and I can't find it, you know? And I spend like 30, 45 minutes looking for it. Finally, I go and search for a librarian and she comes up and she says, well, it's right here. And she looks and it's not there. Um, and she goes, I don't know where, it could be, right? She goes, because it's in the computer, nobody's checked it out. So time had gone by and then she asked somebody else and it turned out that they were, I don't know what you would call this in library terms, I say they were getting rid of the book. Nobody was checking it out, you know? So I guess they brought it down to the basement or wherever it goes to be sold at the next library thing. Um, and they brought it up and they said, I said, I'll buy it from you. And they said, no, 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 we're not ready to sell it just yet. You know, they have the catalog or whatever you, and they said, but you can check it out. Um, and so that from that particular book came my very first book for that essay in that book. And to this day, I still go to libraries also. I mean, I do internet when I need things immediately, you know, if I'm writing and I need something, but libraries, the shelves, the books in my hand, you know, that, that just is part of the process for me. So with The Color of Air, I went to UH in uh, Manoa on the Big Island. And I went and they have a beautiful, huge library there on campus. And I asked the person at the desk, you know, I said, I'm, I'm writing this book on blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, you need to go to the Hawaiian something archives. And they have a whole separate room just for all the, the his historical Hawaii things. Um, so I, I went there and just sat there and, and read and looked through everything. Um, and then the librarian came out and she tapped me on the shoulders and she said, I don't mean to bother you, but are you that author? <laughs> and so it was really nice to be in Hawaii and to be recognized. And she said, I've read all your books. Um, you know, so I mean, I love libraries and I love librarians. I gotta tell you, I've met that the hardest part of not being able to go on a book tour with The Color of Air because it came out in April was the fact that I couldn't go visit the librarians that I've met over the years, you know, because I always spoke in libraries and I always spoke at in independent bookstores and I didn't get to see the bookstore owners or the librarians. And that was the hardest part I have to say. That was Not writing a, for a plane was easy. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a great library story. I loved it. Oh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're endless. I mean, yeah, I mean, 
the the you offer the resources, you know, that, that I, I think that we don't think about until you're doing something like this. You know, I mean, you go and you get the book you want to read. That's one thing, but it goes beyond that. It's, it's when you're trying to write a book, um, the resource materials are endless. And, and if you didn't have them, it would have been, it would make it so much harder for us writers. Right. So, so thank you. Thank you for making more books to put in the library. <laughs> um, and I have a, someone raised their hand. So I'm going to ask you to unmute Cecilia, unless you just type something in the chat. Oop. Okay, so I'm going to ask Cecilia to unmute if she wants to ask her question. And then I have a couple other questions in the chat that I could also go to. Great. And Cecilia might have raised her hand by accident as well. Give her a couple seconds if she would like to ask. And then if not, I will go next to um, Veronica. Would you like to ask your question out loud to the group? Sure. Ready? Okay. Um, I on. wanted to ask you um, how you created the characters in the book. Wow. Were they real people in your lives that you drew from or were they just pure imaginary from your research? Hey, you know, I get this question a lot on this particular book. Um, well, I don't know. I don't so know. Is it, is it because they resonate with real people? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Did. I mean, I think I, really you know, did. as as mm -hmm. as I always say, um, I think every character, in one way or another, comes from some aspect of my life. Um, I pick and choose things. It never is a character a complete person I know. Um, they're all drawn from from details of people I know, um, or people uh, people that I want to know, or people that um, carry one particular thing that goes into that character, um, whether it's be their their wit um, or their height or the way they carry themselves or the jokes they say um, or or a skill set they have, like like. Um, I, I'm trying to remember the name that Noriko <laughs> Nori in, in, in the book um, or Mama Natua comes from, you know, relatives I've had who, who are elderly and who, who, you know, I draw aspects of them and put them into each character. Um, but, you know, the important thing for, I think, writing for me as an author is to be able to write characters in places where you may never have gone to but that you understand who they are and where they come from. And I think that means giving them a certain amount of, of reality, which is people you know, um, a certain amount of empathy, a certain amount of, of uh, you know, real life characteristics. Um, so, that, so that even a place, I mean, I wrote a book that's uh, about the sumo. And I knew that, that what well, would be hard is like, not everybody is interested in a sumo. <laughs> like me, you know, like, how did he become that big boy? Um, you know, why did he want to do this? Uh, so, you know, then my, my job as the writer is to make this character so inviting um, that you know him and that you can understand him. And so you understand the choices he makes and why he's a sumo. Um, and I think that's the idea of that has gone into every book that I've written, that you understand that person and, and the motives, whether they're good or bad. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. And then I'm going to unmute myself and, or actually, Carolyn, I see you're unmuted. So if you want to question, ask your question out loud, you're welcome to, or I can read it to Gail. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes, yes I can. Okay. Um, I too grew up in San Francisco and my best friend's mother was from Hawaii and they would often go to Hawaii on vacation. And so I was eating sushi and dried seaweed before I realized it was, well, it became popular. I didn't even know that. And uh, my question was, they gave me a cultural feeling and I wasn't aware of it. It just opened me up to it. But I'm wondering if it's important also that when you write that you create a cultural culture, the 
you you kind of explain the culture of a person. And I think you've already answered that in the other question mm -hmm. about the characters. And I'm just wondering how important the culture was in developing. And do you explain it in your book? No, I mean, in, I think because I write about cultures that I haven't really lived in, say Japan, say China, my books in China and my Japan, and Japan, and even Hawaii per se, because if you can place defines character, in other words, where they grow up and what they do defines how they look at life. Um, so, you know, all of that works together again in a book. And, you know, I mean, that's the hard part because it's very hard to explain. It sounds in some ways dry when you say, well, you know, um, because he ate sushi all his life, you know, if he went to Iowa, they would be appalled, you know, um, well, I, we don't have that same cultural background. Um, I guess because you introduced the number of the, the elder women who got around and played hearts. They were, uh, the, you referred yes. to them in the book as the aunties club. And just by um, speaking of that, you, the, re the reader got the impression of what an auntie was. And I was wondering if it's important to you to, to explain, to draw out a question like that, or just to let the reader divine their own understanding of what the word means. You use Howley and Hummel. Yeah. And, and, um, Howley, we, uh, it's understood, and sometimes other words are understood, but I'm just, they weren't explained explicitly, but I, just in the use, you gather what they mean. And I'm just wondering if you feel that's more of a valid way to explain culture. Well, I think, I think everybody does it differently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's according to the style of the writer and how they want to approach a subject matter. I, you know, personally, I don't believe that I, I have to explain everything. Mm -hmm. I would hope that it's self-explanation enough to know. I mean, in a lot of cultures, aunties are incredibly important, not just the Asian culture, mm -hmm. but also in the Black culture. Um, in the Indian culture. I mean, we, you know, we can go on and on. And so I thought that enough people would have that kind of understanding um, that the auntie not necessarily has to, has to be a blood relative, um, but a close family, you know, another tangent to the family. Um, and because Hawaii is so filled with that and so is other cultures, I didn't really feel that I needed to explain it like you know, she was a close friend of them. I mean, I hope well, she showed it. But she, it brings a person into the writing a lot better. Yeah, I mean, I do. I think that if you explain too close, much, it yeah. takes away. It takes away from the intimacy mm -hmm. of the reader and the character. Right. Uh, then I had a question. Is I don't really know much about Hawaii. Is Hilo a big city, or were no, they? No. Is this a small community within Hilo? It's a small, well, <laughs> it's a small community. It's Hilo is not a big town. It's still okay. not a big town. I visited a couple of years ago, um, you know, and it's spread out now. The modern big island is much different. Hilo used to be the center because when the plantation uh, plantations were up, there was a lot of money going into the town. Mm -hmm. so when the plantations ended, all the money left the and people spread out more. So if you go now, you'll see malls. I mean, unfortunately, you'll see malls where the people usually go because it's a Target there, right. and it's a Costco there, you know, and there's other things. So the old town of Hilo is much, actually visually, a lot like it was before. There's still the old buildings. There's still the park with the banyan tree that I wrote about in there. Um, you know, so Hilo is not always a big town, but the community that I actually focus on is just that little group of people that you see, but it's a greater community in the sense of, of Hilo town in itself. Um, but it's like here, we don't know everybody in Redwood City or wherever you live. Um, you know, you have your gathering of friends that you hang with and that's how it was there back then. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I had a longtime friend who was born and raised in Hilo, and he ended up in Kauai raising cane. Ah. <laughs> well, Kauai is way smaller than, than the big island, huh? And, um, Jane, but they had a lot of cane there, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jane, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Yeah, I had a question. I read your book online through the Redwood City Library, um, and that frankly has saved my sanity the last few months being able to read online. But I went in and I looked at your name to see if you had more eBooks in that account and I didn't find any. So I'm wondering when you publish a book, is there something different that happens to make it available as an eBook as opposed to a hardcover book and, and how do libraries decide how to do that? A real shop talk question, Gail. Is that for <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I've I've never read an ebook. Um, oh. I've <laughs> read either paperbacks or hardcovers. Um, so I don't exactly know. I mean, I know that when you, I've never gotten it. I mean, Fiona might have to answer this because I don't know how you get the ebooks. I mean, I, I'm sure my books have come out in ebooks. That's why I don't quite understand why they aren't there. Yeah, um, I think I actually read mine an ebook and we, oh, okay. we got it through Libby and uh, Jane, we can have different sessions uh, on Libby that the library can also hold to help with to, to help you get more ebook from uh, Gail. <laughs> But this mm. this licensing question, I think the rights to Gail, all of Gail's books are getting kind of sliced and diced in different ways and sold to these like middleman ebook distributors. And then the library on our side also has to decide to purchase the ebook. So it's a pretty big question. Um, See, I didn't even know that. <laughs> And this is actually my background. So before I was a librarian, I worked for an ebook company, and that's why I know a little bit more about it. We know about that. We know yeah. we have to talk. Mm. But I have good news for um, Jane, which is we have a lot of Gail's books in print. And if you're not able to come to the library, I, Fiona, actually run a program where I um, have books delivered to people in their homes. So we can definitely connect afterwards and I ha I can give you a stack of all of Gail's books. You can read all of them in print. Oh, wow. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put, I want to know about I'll put my e email in the chat for everyone that lives in Redwood City. If you want to know about home book delivery, um, I'm happy um, to talk to you. So I guess yeah. you can't deliver to me. Unfortunately, <laughs> I would love yeah. to, though. <laughs> but the I Redwood would. City Library, I think it's really, well, like I said, it saved my sanity because mm -hmm. I've been able to look at movies and books and, and, and magazines and all kinds of things online without ever going out in the public. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's so it, we know it's so important right now when people are, are feeling um, apprehensive about leaving their homes. Um, yeah, we were so happy to be able to provide that service. So, um, and then I saw what looked like a hand being raised, but maybe it was the clapping hand. So, if you, if anyone else has, Bruce, is Bruce? Bruce, 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 Bruce have Bruce one? Okay, go ahead, Bruce. How's I trying to get onto a radio talk show here? <laughs> uh, I got, I got a couple of things. Um, the uh, population of Hilo in 2020 was 45,000 people. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that speaking of libraries, uh, Redwood City Public Library is among 30 finalists selected for the prestigious 2021 National Medal for Museum and Library Service and the only one from California. So Yay. of course, go Fiona. <laughs> And it's great Go to hear library team. Yeah, that uh, one of the other classes that we did a couple months back with the library, um, that Jane is getting uh, some use out of it. So yay. I do have questions um, or a, a question that's a technical question about, uh, about writing, um, but thank you for being so happy in your presentation. Uh, <laughs> I'm just sitting here smiling, making me happy. I just say, gosh, you smiled the whole time. It was just giggly, bubbly. So thank you for that. But my, my, my question is, this is kind of a technical question. Um, after you finished writing a book, 
did you feel a sense of relief or was there more pressure added to you? I'll give you an example. I, I'm in a band and we had finished, do all the writing and recording and producing, get done and okay, we're finished. Now we gotta go put it out to publish it. And then that's to me where the pressure came. Did you, do you feel pressure like that or is it just? Well, I, I mean, the, there's, there's so many steps involved and, and it's like your schizophrenic with all the feelings that you're gonna have, you know. When I first finish a book, um, there's this great sense of everything, happiness, loss you know you don't <laughs> well yeah. i mean and and finish is is i don't know if you can really say is a book ever finished yeah. you know i mean for the writer i mean there's that constant did i do this did i should i make this better should i go back and write rewrite this you know there's always those questions that you're asking yourself so that's the, that's the part of insecurity that's involved with writing you know that sure. it's always there is it as good as it can be kind of feeling yeah. um did i make this character the way I wanted him or, sh or her to be. Um, so there's that part of it. But you generally know when you reach the end, there's this kind of huge interior sigh of relief <laughs> <laughs> that you've reached that, you know, that you've gotten from page one to page 320 or whatever it is. Um, so that's the first thing you feel. Um, then, then there's that celebratory you know, I got to go get a drink feeling. <laughs> you know, and, um, and then then there's a sense of fear, like, oh no, I'm done. It has to go to my editor now. Will she like it? How much work will I have to do on this? You know, and then past that, it's now it's the public. You know, what if the public doesn't like this? What if, you know, you know, you and and they're very free with telling you. Let me oh, tell yeah. you. <laughs> you know, I mean, especially with the advent of, of the internet. Um, it's very easy to get emails where they, you know, they will just tell you what they feel. Um, uh, fortunately, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky. I've, I have kind readers, but you know, there are, I've, I've had writing friends who have had people write really mean things. Yeah. And, you know, if they knew what it took to write a book, I think they'd be a little gentler <laughs> with, with the writer just because, you know, it's, it's so hard to keep track of so much, but yeah, it's, a, it's that whole whirlwind of feelings. Um, but there's no better feeling than I remember the very first book I wrote when in the mail came the first hardcover copy. And I held it in my hands and I thought, I can't believe this. <laughs> I've written this book and, and my name's on it. <laughs> you know, um, uh, so, you know, and I, I still get that same feeling when I see the hardcover of the book after it's finished, but never like that first one, that first child feeling. Super, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hey. We have a couple of questions that uh, on email, can I answer, ask that? Yeah, please do, please do. Yeah. So Gail, uh, one of the question is, there are so many themes in the book. Are there a couple of themes that you particularly wanna tell the audience through this book, The Color of Air? And the next question is, uh, what's your big idea for the next book? So. <laughs> You don't make it easy on me to leave, huh? Hey, I'm just reading it. It's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I think I think that there's there's certain themes that run through all my books, and I think that happens with every author. Mm -hmm. That somehow there's there's certain things ingrained in who you are that you always end up writing about, even when you're trying to run away from it. It leads you right back to it. Um, and I think for me, it's family always is in there somewhere. Um, a sense of community, um, I, uh, whether it be silk working women, whether it be this young man who has to go to this remote place, um, the community he finds, even with the manservant and this woman who has leprosy. I mean, I, this sounds like you can't make this up, um, but you know, I mean, th that idea too. So family, community, um, Beauty was another theme that I think ran through a lot of the earlier books. Um, what is beauty? Um, is beauty what you see outside or is it something that comes from the inside? Uh, what else? You know, and uh, certainly all the cultural things um, that I'm fortunate enough to be able to write about to bring out different aspects of, of my culture that maybe readers don't know about. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot about why I love writing, 
to be able to explore those things, not only for myself, but for the reader. Um, and what am I working on? <laughs> I am working on something. I can't believe that. I, I can't even say that. Um, I, I, I don't want to talk too much about the subject matter. It's the first book that I'm actually writing about a person who was alive. Wow. So um, it's a whole new thing. And again, it's this idea of stretching yourself to do something different. Um, uh, and she's an Asian woman who made, who was one of the first <laughs> at what she does. Um, and so I'm trying to, I'm trying now to formulate that into a, a novel. Mm. So again, you know, bring, bringing out something that maybe people missed in their lives. It's very intriguing. I'm excited. <laughs> I know. I'm afraid if I say it, you know, I, mean, I you know, I, I don't know if you, any of you had read the book Loving Frank about Frank Lloyd Wright. And I remember when my friend was writing it, she kept saying to me, she kept saying to me, but you can't tell anybody, you can't tell anybody. And it's this whole idea that there might be another writer out there in the world writing the same about that same person. And so you're not supposed to say anything. And that's why I'm, be, I'm usually not like this if it were my own fictional book. I could just say, oh, I'm writing about a community in Hawaii or I'm da, 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 da. But because I'm writing about a specific person, I'm afraid, again, like the same thing, that I'm not supposed to be saying it because I could be telling it to one of these people out here who are a writer and they're going to sit down and beat me to it. <laughs> right. Or maybe <laughs> it's in the zeitgeist and they're already yeah. writing <laughs> Um, I had a question from Veronica that said, are you teaching right now, teaching about writing? And if not, will you be in the future? Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm no longer nine to five teacher. Um, what I do occasionally is I teach at um, what used to, like, like this summer, I'll be teaching at, they're now called the Community of Writers. They used to be the Squaw Valley. Um, community of writers. I'll do like these weekly things where I'll do a workshop or, you know, um, I used to tag team a little with Mills College. Oh, Mills College, poor Mills College. Oh um, you know, where I, where I would teach uh, one or two graduate courses or something like that. Um, but I've pretty much retired from the full time teaching kind of thing, aspect of it. Um, oh, I would love to attend your classes on when you're teaching about how to write, how to do research. Okay, well, if you know, I mean, I do, I do have a website now. So what if I, okay. if I what I'll do is if I'm teaching a week long workshop or if I'm doing something mm -hmm. like that, I'll put it up on the website. Great, thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna set you up for another maybe easy question and then also give the audience time to maybe think of one or two more questions. Is that okay, Tina, for time? Yes, uh, yeah, we have about okay. five more minutes. Yeah. So my hopefully easier question is, I've heard that you're involved in a nonprofit organization yes. called Waterbridge. What is it? Can you tell me more about it? Uh, you are a sweet <laughs> librarian. <laughs> I try, I try. <laughs> When I told you that I had this this interval where I wasn't writing, um, and it was uh, like a six year or five year interval um, before *The Color of Air* came out, and the book before that was a uh, uh, hundred flowers. I'm trying to think. I, I've forgotten. It was so long. Um, I was doing some nonprofit work, and the nonprofit is called Waterbridge Outreach Books and Water. And what it allowed me to do. Um, is to give back as a writer. Um, I, I, when I was young, I really, really wanted to join the Peace Corps. Um, and my mom didn't want me to. Um, she didn't want her daughter going off to, you know. And then of course, I, I wanted to do so many things, but it fell and I fell into writing. Um, and the Peace Corps and all that idea kind of went to the back seat. Um, and so what I did was during this time off, I thought, I'm now at this point in my life where I, hopefully I can use the resources, use what I've gained as a writer and to do something for other people um, and hopefully children and hopefully in terms of, of water projects and books and literacy projects. So we've been in business um, for the last six, seven years. Um, we morphed from other 
uh, book and book prize kind of uh, situation. And it's been a wonderful thing. And I've brought in other writers. Um, so, so we do everything from setting up mobile libraries in Pakistan and India to we published in Kiswahili books for, for elementary schools. We've built um, laboratories and, and pit latrines, they're called there, um, for schools, for, for school that had 2,600 kids and, and maybe six toilets. Um, you know, so I mean, it's growing in terms of, of the projects, the kind of projects we do, but it mainly it's trying to get books um, in the hands of kids who don't have the opportunities that we have. And a lot have to do with the library aspect of get Fiona, I need to get you involved with this. Um, it's actually, um, you know, setting up libraries. We just set up two libraries in Cambodia um, for schools that are out in rural areas um, who, have, who have had the village actually build their school. Um, and we put in the library for them within the school. Uh, so it's it's like the best of both worlds for me. I, I feel incredibly fortunate to be able to to do the two things now that I love most in the world, which is to write books, um, and then to get books and water projects in the hands of, of communities who need it. That's fantastic. And actually, there are um, some folks from our Friends of the Library used books sale organization at this event too. That might also be good contacts. But yeah, I would I would love to learn more about that in the future. Okay, do we have one for do we have time for another question? A couple more? One more. One more. Okay, this is another easy, relaxing final question. I yes. should have put wine in the glass. <laughs> I <of> know. <laughs> you did fool us at the beginning. <laughs> um, so Dorothy asks, what is your favorite Hawaiian food? Is there anything that you crave? Oh. Huh. Boy, that's a good question, but it's hard at the same time because <laughs> um, Hawaiian food. Well, I like any kind of the raw fish things that we don't get here as much. Um, you know, I remembered when I was young that, I mean, ramen now here is like the big deal, big thing. But the first places that I really ate ramen was in Hawaii when I was a kid going back then. So that's always been a big, I love noodles. I love carbs, let's face it, any kind of carb. Um, uh, but there, I, you know, I, I get the biggest kick and I still like, I mean, it's not like I eat like this normally, but when I do go back, I always go, go get a plate lunch. And a plate lunch is when you have every carb you could think of. You have a scoop of rice, you have a scoop of potato salad or macaroni salad. <laughs> um, you have something like a, a chicken or pork katsu or, or chicken teriyaki, um, and it's all in one plate, and it's huge. Um, mm -hmm. But that's always something I kind of tie into to Hawaii life. Um, that and having sushi on the beach. I remember doing that as a kid. Um, that was another thing. Um, so, you know, all those kind of things you kind of miss and you tie it into the place. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. I know I'm hungry now. I am too. <laughs> Um, so I, it's tea from, time. you can have something now, right? Our late, our late lunch tea. Mm -hmm. So I guess I will pass it over to Tina, but I, I get, I'm so honored to have gotten to talk with you and help moderate this discussion. And I do hope that you will be able to come to our library again in the future when we're so all too. able to travel. Thank, Thank you, Fiona. You did a great job. It's nice to meet you also. I'll Thank look you. for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona, for moderating. And thank you, Gail. We are so honored to have you. And thank you for joining our community. And we would love to have you back. And thank you again from Anytime. the bottom. Thank you so much for coming, <laughs> listening to me go on and on, um, <laughs> and having me here today. I wish you much success for the rest of the day. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just bow. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.